24. And now the older I go, bound in the spirit, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall upon me, but the fall me there. Stay the Holy Spirit is witness in every city, city, saying, Bonds and affliction abide and despite me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I not my life dear unto me, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministries which I have received of the Lord Jesus. To testify the grace of the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God. We often look at these stories, or, or better words, or, uh, scriptures, so we call them stories, and we wonder what faith did these men speak of? These men are men who have trusted in God. They, they trust in the providence of God. And today, God asks us the same thing to put him first. And so we must ask ourselves today what is hindering us in our own walk of faith? So, two masters. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and man. Man is associated with materialism. It's the things that we put above God, the things that keep us away from him. And Jesus tell us, tells us in the first commandment that we must love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And it has become a warning to us to not fall into distractions, into the things, the love of the world that keeps us away from Him. Today, one can very easily be swept from God and fall into something else appealing to their lives. We might invest much more time in pursuing money, relationships, entertainment. We may deeply pursue these things and not make time for our lives. When we are not a slave to Christ, we become a slave to our passions. Every person is guilty of all the good they did not do. In our lives, we face many distractions, and society is unavailable to face distractions. Um, but we are told to walk above the sea. Like when Peter was called to the water, he was not, Jesus did not remove the water, but he told Peter to walk on top of the water. We are told to be in the world, but not of the world. And so, despite all like, the propaganda you will find in the schools, the indoctrinated teachers, and the people that you will communicate with in society, we must never fall prey to these things. And we see it is, it is also afflicted in our own, in our own churches of uh, people following what they want. And progressive churches and mega churches, we see them stylized, the music, and the leaders focusing more on money and not on the obedience of the people's souls. And it has led many people astray. And we can fall prey to this to our own distraction when we put something above God. James 4, every person is guilty of all the good they did not do. James 4, 17, therefore to him that no one do good and do it not, to him it is sin. I know what I have to do. These are the words that have been said by many people. We may neglect our own duties as Christians, our own responsibilities. And it is both words that people say, trusting in a constant tomorrow. We trust that we will wake up tomorrow, that we will always have another tomorrow. And it is a lie that we deceive ourselves with, that we will always have another tomorrow, that we will always have more time to prepare, to recompense, have more time to do the things that we want to do, but we are mistaken. It is a mistake that will send us to the grave, unprepared, convicted, and dead. And people say they are waiting for the time and it's convenient. I thought the same thing. I thought I had to stand here with a, a white beard and a cane. But it, it, we don't know where our life will leave us. We don't know if we will live tomorrow. We do not know will be in the next hour. I have my script here, but I'm trying you know, to uh, speak, speak clearly. Uh, before James tells us that the time for repentance is now, he said, what is your life? It's but a vapor that appeared for a time and vanishes away. And he tells us, we do not have the time to wait. We do not have time to wait for a more convenient time. 
We must do everything now. We're told every week, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to do the good that you want to do. Today is now. We must do all things now. We must never wait. And we must put God first. But today we'll be looking at things we might follow. We might follow our own emotions. And emotions is a thing that has led many to crime, has led many to jail, and to do things that they ought not to do. As Christians, we are told to be a master of our own emotions, a master of our own bodies, a master of our own soul. We must be the master of our own lives to have one soul master. That in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 23, it says, Now the works of the flesh manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lavishness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, bearings, emulation, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murder, drunkenness, reviling, and such like. Of which I have told you before, as I have told you in time that, that they which do such things shall not inherit kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. With Christ we have fruit of the Spirit. If we seek Christ, we can be we are promised these, these fruits of the Spirit. And when we do otherwise, we do that we do not trust in him, we will not find peace in our lives. But we must always remember that God provides for those he loves, and those who love him. And so our love for God must be everywhere. We must constantly love God in a continual manner. And so in Ephesians, we read of the danger. Anger, it is said, has not produced the righteousness of God. What good thing can occur in anger? Moses' anger brought him to disobey God. Cain's anger led him to murder his brother Abel. In anger, Jesus tells us in the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew, verse 21, that a person who is angry with their brother will be subject to judgment. That person who so much as calls their brother a fool will be subject to hell fire. John tells us in the first John chapter 4, verse 20, If a man says, I love God, and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can you love God whom he hath not seen? Instead of anger and hatred, as Christians, we are called to forgive. We are called to this forgiveness as God has forgiven us. As Joseph, if you remember the story of, of Joseph, how his brothers sold him into slavery. And Joseph, being sold into slavery, became second in line head to Pharaoh. And when he met with his brothers, he had all the power to get revenge on his brothers. He could have done whatever he wanted to be so thoughtful. But instead, we read how Joseph, when he met his brothers, he hugged them. He embraced them and he cried on his shoulders. And we are called to the same standard of forgiveness, to, to forgive others even though they have done us wrong. And as Christians, we cannot expect to be forgiven, forgiven if we have not forgiven those who have done us wrong. And when we are called to the standard, we are not only called to this, but we are called to pray for those who have done us wrong. And to do this, we must have humility and we must be humble. It is written in, in, in Peter chapter 1, verse 15 through 16, of which, in which, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy, no manner of conversation, as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We may also well pray in our relationships. Um, many people have gone astray, they have married into other religions, and they may have fallen away. I see it in those schools. There are kids who have communicated with the wrong crowd and they have, they have gone into drugs and games and all types of things. And we cannot think of ourselves as different, that we cannot fall prey to people that we communicate with. And it says in Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, be not deceived, do not lie to yourself. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And it becomes hard when you have a family, if you have 
Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sin, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We must ask ourselves if we are friends of the world. If we are friends of the world, the question abounds on our own, then we must examine ourselves as as it is said in in first in chapter two Corinthians chapter, I mean second Corinthians chapter six verse thirteen through sixteen it says be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness unrighteousness and what communion hath light and darkness we see the comparison between light and darkness where the light cometh the darkness receives and where the dark cometh the light receives um, so Christians are like the light and sinners are like the darkness. If we are bringing darkness to our lightness, then there is a question our own, our own lightness of are we doing the right thing to bring the right crowd? And so either a person will bring love upon God and hate upon themselves, or they will bring love upon their friends and hate upon God. But we cannot do both. We cannot be friends of the world and love God at the same time. We may fall victim to wealth. Many people trust in their wealth. They trust in their cars and they do not think of tomorrow. They think, what, what, what can happen to me? I have money. They, they might not trust. They always trust that they will always have another place to sleep in, another meal to eat, another place that, that they will always have to live in. But it is poor men that must learn to trust in God, to trust that they will be provided in the things that they have. And so when we have wealth, we may become arrogant. It is not the, the wealth that we have, but it's the greed of money that makes that may make us big for us. And when we trust in our wealth, we trust less than God. And this lack of trust brings us a lack of wealth. John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Rich people, they may trust in their wealth, but when we come to the end of our days, we soon come to realize what is really important in life. And what is important is the love and obedience that we have shown in our lives to God. Because the conscience will attack the mind in death. They will know that it is going to another place. And so many people come to Christ unprepared. When they come to the end of the day, they come to seek comfort in their own life. But we must always remember that this comfort that we are seeking, that we must always pursue it because we never know when our lives will come to this end. Are we comfortable with Christ? Are we, are we prepared to die today? <laughs> Lastly, we may become, we may become slaves of ourselves. When we neglect our own duties, our own way of life, we reap judgment unto ourselves. When we know what is right to do, but we don't do it, we reap judgment unto ourselves. We bring ourselves to church in the flesh, but we worship in truth and spirit because God is the spirit. So though I should come to all services in the flesh, Though I should know all doctrine, but I do not heed to the words of God, it has profited me nothing. I have gained no fruit, I have gained no, no wealth in spirit. So though I should go into baptism, it is not the end. Many people think baptism is the end, that once I'm baptized, I can do anything I want. I can think anything I want, and do anything I want. And here in churches, once saved, always saved. But this is a mistake. It's a uh, mistake that lead many to disregard what Christianity is all about. 
It is not a one-time baptism. It is a continual sacrifice of Christ. A continual crucifixion of self. That is the Christian law. It is not a one-time thing. It is not the end of baptism. Baptism is just the beginning of the Christian law. And so we see Christians in the casinos, in the bars, that they themselves believe themselves to be Christians, but it is Christian in name only. They are indistinguishable from the world. They are filled with lots of rage. They are brawlers and adulterers. They are yet to pick up their own cross in their lives and expose themselves as as hypocrites to the name Christian that they bear. May we be continual lovers of Christ, continual doers of the word. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so, we are warned in John 12, John 15, verse 5, that worldly passions make us unfruitful. In the, so- in the, store- the parable of the sower, Jesus tells us how each of us receive the word of God differently. Jesus tells us the person who sows the word of God but are indebted to their own passion, to their own, their own pursuit of material wealth, will not produce fruit. Yet plainly in their hearts will find no place where the word of God can bloom in the thorns of passion and soil of riches. The word is incompatible with this lifestyle. And so we hear people who say they are too busy with God, too busy to, for the worship of God, too busy for their duties to read the Bible, to to speak out and, and speak out for Christ. They have become prospered in love but poor in spirit. But we must realize that none of our passions, none of our wealth will be brought to grave. And whether we lived a good life was not of how fortunate we were, or how much wealth we had, how much buildings we owned, or how much influence we had, as society would tell us in the school, become a doctor, be rich, have a limited fun, and that kind of life. It is a limited life that we are told to have, but as Christians, we are told to, do, to be more, to do more as Christians. To spread the word of God and to love God with all our hearts. And so we must ask ourselves, how do we how do we produce good, good how do we produce fruit? Um, and the sower of in the parable of the sower, God tells us it is the it is the one who does not chase after their own riches and wealth. The one who is not attached to worldly cares and the things of the world. It is the one who endures persecution and tribulation. It is he that hears the word and understands that produces both the fruit and the good soil. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I am him, the same bring forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. A branch cannot produce fruit lest it is nurtured by the vine, and the branch by itself is not sufficient but dead without the vine. But if, if we are to be bounded in Jesus Christ, if we are to if we are looking to produce fruit, there must be a constant process, a constant daily connection to Jesus Christ. In our prayers, in our study of the scriptures, and in truth and action. When we are not producing the environment for fruit, and tending to the nurturing of our own spirit, we cannot expect to be fruitful. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. As Christians, we must understand the very dangers of serving another master. Judas served another master when he sold Jesus for 30 pieces. He picked material wealth over his own master. The apostles were successful in their mission because despite fear, despite persecution, despite tribulation that they in poverty that they faced, they entrusted that God would provide for them, that Jesus would provide for them no matter what they endured. Are we trusting the same thing? Trusting that God will provide for us. And so, Christians must not serve another master. Being a Christian, the 
does not just mean sincerity. It does not mean just believing. It does not mean just coming to church every Sunday. And it does not just come to Christ when it's convenient or we are in need of it. A Christian is a person who has made a daily commitment to following Christ. A person who has relinquished their old man, a person after God's own heart, is crucifying themselves daily, following Christ in the good, the bad, and the ugly. In tribulation and persecution, it is a Christian who has chosen the narrow road. It is a follower of Christ who has picked up their own cross beside Christ to follow him in the world. It is a Christian, the Christian life entitles self denial and self control. Luke and, and Luke 9, verse 23 to 24, he says to them all, If any man will come after me, let, them, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Are we followers of Christ? Are we willing to not only hear his word, but listen to it? Have we crucified ourselves with Christ? Crucify our greedy, lustful, and angry man. Crucify all that opposes God and pull us away from him. Have we chosen to pursue this relationship with Christ? Have we picked him continually, or have we become spiritually dead, spiritually lame? In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, it says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit be mortified the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Uh, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their passions and wants. If we live in spirit, let us also walk in spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. How do I know if I'm a Christian? They that are Christ. Is it the richest man, the loudest man, or the most intellectual man? It is the behavior and actions that we show ourselves truly crucified with Christ. The man who has become the master of his own mind and body, who has paid evil for good as his sole master has taught him, it is that he that which is Christ. If we are seeking to be obedient, obedient unto God, we must examine where we are walking. If we are to walk by faith, we do not walk in a bar, we do not walk into a party where the world goes. But instead, we are encouraged in Scripture to associate with like minded people. To not go where the Lord rejoices, but where the Spirit is rejuvenated, where it is cultivated, so that our inner man may be strengthened and reinforced. And so we must guard ourselves with who we associate with and examine our own habits. Our habits can, can consume our spiritual, spiritual man. The habits that draw us away from God, from our own Christian responsibilities, are the habits that we must examine. If we are to be obedient, if we are to produce fruit for God, we must examine our own self. And so we must discern what is evil and what is good. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, it says, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearances of evil. James chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and desire. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. And so, we must recognize the roots of our sin. Where is it that we fall short? And these are the things that we must examine in our life and remove them. If we are to be fruitful, to be honest. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body shall, should be cast into hell. Jesus we must examine what we are doing. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25 to 27. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyes look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy way be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left, and remove thy foot from evil. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself place to obey are the one whom you obey, whether of sin leading to righteousness or of obedience leading to righteousness. 
but I'm still used to that or I'm being in things like this. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural case in glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue therein, he being an unforgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his feet. If you remember the person we are in church, it is the same person that we walk out every day. We must continually be the same person, continually do good in our daily lives. Um, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Revelations chapter 22, verse 10. Behold, I come to him, my Lord is with me, to give every man at his works of me. When we endure tribulation in our lives, we are promised that in the end we will always have a paradise waiting for us. Though we should be burned, though we should be insulted, though we should be in poverty, we will always have a place in the end, in paradise with Jesus Christ. In conclusion, a man, a Christian, cannot serve emotions, wealth, relationships, or himself. The invitation is sent to you today. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sin, confess his name before men, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. Only stand and stand. Do not stand still in these things. Do not stand still as babies who are being aborted on.
that we will find ourselves falling into sin. And when sin has developed, slowly our hearts begin to harden to where our ears become dull and our eyes no longer perceive God. And this is the devil's deception for, for mankind. To be ignorant, to not care, to be unguarded, to let me go. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of, the world, of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe well, unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I often think of aggressive churches and politics when regarding pride, they call good evil, and evil good. And these are dangers of those who believe the truth to be factual in aggressive churches, that they believe that this is the, the way to path salvation. It is not a danger of, well it is a danger then of the churches that will tell you that you will be prosperous if you give money. They have made people poor, they have deceived people into thinking that this is the correct path to salvation. And it is not, it is a danger that makes people poor and is a loss of salvation, a loss of souls. And this is the danger of these progressive churches. People have changed the word of God to fit themselves they want Christianity to be easy, to fit their lifestyles, how they want to do things, that if they pay the church, they will have a nice car waiting outside in due time. And this is this is dangerous, as people are confused and lost, looking in the wrong direction. But the truth of Christianity is that you will have to give something up. It is not easy. It is not something that you just confess with your mouth and you will be saved. Well, let me reiterate that. There are people who will go on the streets and they will say, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But then they will go on their way, and that's it. This is the end of their, their path. But this is not how it is. Christianity, <coughs> you have to give something up. There is a price to pay in following Christ. And it does not come with a fancy car of the riches of life. But in following Christ, there is something far greater than any temporary dime or watch. It is the gift promised to disciples and each and every one of us of everlasting life. A, a reward far greater than any price, than any other life. Wherefore, take unto you the full armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand an evil day, and to let all withstand, and stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Second Timothy, chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, Study to shew, shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that ye have not to be ashamed, who is divide, rightly dividing the word of truth. We cannot be ignorant regarding the gospel. What is the true path of salvation that people have not taken their study into and are being lost that in deception of the world? We must study that so that we may know what is good and acceptable, what is right and wrong, and when deception is being told in the churches, what is the truth? And it is a shame how far the churches have drifted away from the truth, how they have changed and altered it to fit their lifestyle, but they will not have to change. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Many people do not want to be rebuked. They will tell you not to judge, but it is, it is a necessary judgment, a righteous judgment, that to rebuke someone it is, it is a matter of love, that we were willing to tell someone the truth. And so the armor of God is not only a defense against sin, but it's also an offensive weapon. And is a and you find that many, that the word of God has not changed since its creation. But people have looked to water it down, to modernize it for its bias and ideals, to remove and add to it. And the moment we do this, it is no longer the truth. It's no longer the calm, the word of God. In fact, when we are told that we will follow Christ, we are not told that we will have fancy cars, that we will have people that we will not be faced with trials and tribulations. Instead, we are told that we will face, that we will be subject to these trials and tribulations. Romans 6, 6, 8 through 16 and 17, the Spirit itself bears witness of our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, the heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ. If so be that we suffer with them, that we may all be also glorified. 
Peter did not keep his eyes singular on God, he began to drown. He began to fall into the water. And so in our lives, we must too keep our eyes on God always. And it's not going to be easy being a Christian. We must be prepared. We must be strong in faith and truth. So, so we must always keep our eyes on the cross. And whether we should lose property, money, friendships, these these things that are temporary, we must never lose our sight on that which is everlasting. In the eternal paradise of Christ, that will be our reward. James 2.5 Well, as Christians, we will often we may face poverty. <coughs> James 2.5 says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not chosen God chosen the poor of this world of rich and faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love that love him? It is easy to say, I love God, when we are not tested, when we are not put in trials, when we are rich. And people have taken their confidence in their riches, that they will not face tribulation because of their riches. But when we are tested, when we are trial, it is when we draw closer to Christ. It is when the, our love is tested of Christ. And we must move forward, continue strong in the faith, that there is a hope and there is a reward to those that love Him. In persecution, chapter 2, Tim, Timothy chapter 2, verse 3-12 through 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. Some think that there is no persecution of Christians in America, but it is wrong. The, the, the government of America has persecuted Christians from the inside, and in, in <coughs> government, we are persecuted. The church, the Christian troops against unjust living are not allowed to be sent in the streets. They will be censored, and a person that goes against it will possibly be arrested. They could face societal backlash and harm. They could lose their job, and this is the current situation of our nation today. That we speak these truths loud enough you will face the same persecution as the apostles, that you will be hated, you will be insulted, and tested. In Africa and in parts of Asia, Christians become martyrs for their faith. They are executed in silence. A Bible is not allowed in Saudi Arabia or in Korea, and churches are controlled by the government of China, and are not allowed to be sold. But in all these tests and all our tribulations, we find a living faith. <coughs> That our faith, when our faith is tested, it is when we are strong. Paul said, when I am weak is when I am strong. And so in our tests and tribulations, it grows experience. It experience hope. And this is when our faith is truly grows. We may fall and we may fall into temptation. James, first James, <coughs> verses two through three says, My brethren, count it all joy when you die, when you fall into diverse temptation. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work is patience. In all lessons, when we face trials, when we face temptations, we are to learn from them. When we face these trials and temptations, we strengthen our own faith as we rely on something that is, that is more than ourselves to give us hope, to give us that patience that secures the experience to face life's challenges. We strengthen the armor of God. Romans 5 through 3, chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation works with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love, of, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The armor of God is our defense and offense to evil. It is our hope in tribulation. When we are guarded, however, we must not think that we have already won the victory in spiritual warfare. Is a constant battle requiring constant vision, vigilance, prayer, and repentance. Repentance is not a one-time thing. People say with perfect repentance that we will never fall prone to temptation again. But it is a constant battle, a constant battle that each and every one of us face. And when we do fall, we must get back up. This is a basic principle that when we fall, we must get back up. And the moment we do not get back up, this is when fall from failure. <coughs> James chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resists the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We must not think of ourselves as the worst person 